Dodge City and in the territory on West, there is just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal, the first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Have you noticed? You hear something new at soda fountains today. People are saying... Pepsi, please. Pepsi, please. Why don't you say it, too, and enjoy a light, clean-tasting fountain Pepsi-Cola? So stop in soon. Get off your feet. Your fountain service can't be beat. Most cheese and cheese. Say Pepsi, please. Now it's Pepsi. For those who think young... sure like to meet whoever's around in the kitchen in this place. Oh, why, Kitty? A cook that can make antelope stew taste like prairie dog ought to be something to see. <laughs> well, at least it's hot. No, it's not. Well, mine is. You're forgetting you dumped half that bowl of chili peppers in yours. <laughs> you spoil, Kitty. Dodge is in St. Louis. <laughs> St. Louis? I was there six months, four years ago. <laughs> Hello there, Kitty. Doc. How are you, Doc? Oh, fine, fine. Sit down, sit down. Oh. oh, what are you eating? Stew? Well, that's what they call it. Well, I'll try a little anyway. Then I'm going to go to bed. At noon? I was up all night, Kitty, out at the Brandt place. Oh, Mrs. Brandt have a baby? Yeah, it's a boy. That's five I've delivered out there. Seems to me it's about time they gave you one, Doc. <laughs> no, no, thanks. I've got enough trouble all by myself. But I'll tell you something, Matt. It's got so I'm afraid to be driving under the prairie at all. No Indian? I ran into Sam Butler uh, just outside there. He drove in with his whole family and all his belongings loaded onto his wagon. He says he's quit. Why? Pawnees wiped out another family up near his place on the Smoky Hill River a couple of days ago. Well, yeah, that's the second raid in the last two weeks. No wonder he's scared. Maybe he's telling everyone who will listen that it's a shameful thing for the law to be hiding out in Dodge City... While whole families are being slaughtered in the country. He is, huh? Yes. I thought you'd like to know. Yeah. Uh, you sit with Kitty, Doc. I'm going to go have a talk with Sam Butler. Sure. Yes. See you both later. Murdering savages is plumb crazy. No, right. You can't fight a Pawnee war party all by yourself. And we sure ain't getting no help from the law around here. We can die and rot for all the law cares. Right. Hello, Sam. Well, where have you been hiding, Marshal? I heard the Pawnees made another raid up near you. If you call shooting and scalping a man and his wife and their two boys a raid, well, those men never had a chance to fight, far as I see. Men? The boys were coming on 14 or 15, old enough to handle a rifle. But they got caught outside. They never even made the house. Never made the house. I seen them with my own eyes, Marshal. And if you'd seen them, you'd be doing something about it instead of sitting around here and dying. Yeah. I'm not hired to fight Indians, Sam. That's the Army's job. Then you ought to be out helping Army. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every lawman in the country ought to. The Army doesn't need help. But there's something strange about those Pawnees. What's strange about them? They've killed white men before. I think I'll ride up there and look around. I'm sorry you're quitting, Sam. We need settlers out here. Not dead ones, you don't. No, that's right. Not dead ones. A new 
week in the CBS Radio Network calendar of events brings with it hourly on the hour, longer, stronger CBS News coverage. To keep informed on developments near and far, lend an ear here. And keep in mind as your day and week progress, not only the news, but its color and background are amply covered by this station. The CBS Radio Network features Sidelights with Douglas Edwards probes a new aspect of latest events each weekday. In the lively feature, A Woman's Washington, CBS Newswoman Nancy Honchman reviews the Capitol scene for stories of highest current interest. David Schoengrun serves amiably as your man in Paris to unlock secrets of the City of Light. Alan Jackson offers fascinating facts of every kind on Information Central. Zachary Scott reveals the romantic backgrounds of famous people in Man and Wife. These are among your daily listening features on the network with the different sound in news and information. CBS Radio, available where you're listening now. <laughs> Chester and I left Dodge that afternoon, and toward evening the next day, we ran across a troop of cavalry camped on the Smoky Hill River, and commanded by a young officer who was new to this part of the country, a Captain Starr. He was anxious to make a success of his first expedition, but so far he hadn't even seen an Indian. I decided to stay with him for a while, and I'm glad I did. The next afternoon, while we were on the march, his scouts reported another settler's cabin burned. The family killed. At my request, Captain Starr filed his troop out in patrols while he and Chester and I rode forward to the scene of the slaughter. The whole family. Man and wife and their boy. Look over there, Chester. Against the water barrel. Oh, my. It's a little girl. Yeah. Scout them. Every one of them. Even that little girl. They even scalped her. Now, at least they didn't torture them. Did they torture the other family, Captain? No, they didn't, Marshal. They shot them just like this. Scalped them. Where are you going, Marshal? What is it? Captain Starr. Last night you told me this is your first tour of duty in Indian country. That's right, Marshal. Take a look around, Captain. I have. All right, all three of these settler families were killed in the open, outside their cabins. Now, does that mean anything to you? Well, I guess the Pawnees surprised them. Yeah, they sure did. There are not many arrows around. If these people had had a chance to put up a fight, there'd be a lot of arrows. But they were shot, Marshal, with rifles. Look at the ground, Captain. There are no tracks. Every sign of the track's been dragged out with a blanket. Yeah. Yes, you're right. I hadn't noticed that. There's one other thing you hadn't noticed or maybe you don't know about. What's that? That boy there. How old would you say he was? Oh, about the same age as the boy at the last place, maybe 12, 13. Yeah. Well, Captain, that's old enough to be a brave in a couple of years if he was a Pawnee. Now, what do you mean, if he was a Pawnee? They usually keep a boy that age. They don't kill him. They take him and try to make a brave out of him. Oh. Oh, I didn't know that. You don't think it was Pawnees that done this, Mr. John? No, I don't, Chester. Man Warren Moccasins doesn't care about his tracks. He's got nothing to hide. Well, I'm afraid I don't understand, Marshal. It wasn't Pawnees that did this, Captain. It wasn't Indians at all. It was white men. Marshal Dillon. Yeah. No white man would shoot that little girl over there. And then the scalper. Captain, did you ever hear what Chivington did to the Cheyennes at Sand Creek? Kill and scalp them all, he said. Big and little. Nits make lice. Congress has repudiated that whole affair, Marshal. Well, it still happened, Captain, and there was still white men that did it. Yes, I suppose you're right. I'm right. But why did they do it? There was horses. See that corral out there? This man must have had six, seven head of horses. Yes. 
The other settlers did, too. They stole the horses and probably whatever they could find in the cabins. And right now they're sitting around camp somewhere drinking coffee and laughing at all of us Indian hunters. I'll find them. It's a big country, Captain. I've got a troop of cavalry out there, Marshal. Over a hundred men. All right, suppose you do find some riders with a bunch of horses. How are you going to know they're the men you're after? Those horses are branded, aren't they? What brands? I don't know, but they must be registered somewhere. Yeah, maybe. Well, you're finding all that out. Some of the families are going to be slaughtered. No, Captain, there isn't time. I didn't realize how new I am at this game, Marshal. What would you suggest? Well, there uh, used to be a corral about five miles upriver from here. Little standard, we'll bait it with a couple of dozen head of good cavalry horses. They'll come to us. Good idea. And I'll have my troop deployed, ready to move in. No, that wouldn't work, Captain. You can't hide a hundred men. You'll have to keep your cavalry clear away. But how can we... Chester and I'll be there. We'll, we'll wait for them. Here's another load of them green branches, Mr. John. Yeah, we'll throw them on the fire, Chester. Let's have some more smoke. Yes, sir. Yeah, that'll do it. How to see that if they're anywhere this side of the Rocky Mountains. They're sure to be scouting around. They ain't stole enough horses to leave the country yet. Besides, they're feeling mighty safe. They'll come. Mr. John? Yeah? I've been thinking. It's doing that'll make you rich, Chester, not thinking. I don't care so much about being rich as going on living. No, what's bothering you? Well, sir, there's only two of us. I was wondering how many there are of them. You want to go back and find the cavalry? You didn't answer my question, Mr. Jones. How many do you think we're waiting for? Yeah, there's no way of telling. Well, if there's a whole pack of them, how in the world are we going to take them? I don't really care how we take them, just... You're pretty mad, ain't you? I just can't get that little girl out of my mind. Huh, look up. Here comes somebody. No, no. Just some cowboy, probably. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, sure it is. He seen smoke from our fire, and now he's wondering what that old crowd's doing full of horses. He might be scouting it for the others. Those men don't take many chances. Well, how are we going to find out? Well, maybe we won't till it's too late. You heat up some coffee for him, huh? Uh, Chester? I think I'll have a cup of that, too. All right, sir. Morning. Morning. Would you get on, stranger? We'll have some hot coffee up in a minute. Yeah. Let me tie my horse here. Sure use some coffee. I had to make a dry camp last night. Oh? Hey, you couldn't have been very far away. Why didn't you ride on down to the river here? I'll tell you why, mister. I was lost. The road till after dark. I got lost. Your horse could have found it for you. Well, maybe my horse ain't as smart as yours. No offense. Sit down. Chester's bringing the coffee now. I've been sitting all morning. Here you are, mister. We ain't got no sugar. Oh. You've been traveling pretty light, ain't you? What do you mean? Hey, here's your coffee, John. Oh, thanks. You know all them horses? They all would like for us. Uh, Might a big remote of no wagons. Not much grub, I can see. They were driving those horses to Cheyenne. There's only two of us. We couldn't handle a wagon and the herd like both. Oh, you only two of you? Yeah, sir. Well, uh, I'm drifting, mister. Maybe you could use another hand. Yeah, maybe. Where are you from? Dakota Territory. Name of Lee Stapp. And I'd sure like to see Cheyenne. I've never been there. Why don't you ride up there alone? It'll be chasing a herd of horses all the way. Yeah, I'm broke, mister. I wouldn't have much of a party in Cheyenne broke, would I? No, I don't guess you would. I'm a good hand. I'll work cheap. Well, how about it? You're a good hand, huh? Yeah, sure. Of course I am. Mister, I wouldn't hire you to herd sheep. 
What? You said you made a dry camp last night. How come you tie your horse up without watering him while you stand here slopping up coffee? Well, it's my horse, ain't it? Yeah, sure. How's the coffee? Uh, the, the coffee? Is it any good? Well, sure, sure it is. All right, then have some more of it. That's one part. Chester? Yes, sir. Here, catch his gun. I got it. Now go get some rope. We'll tie him up while he's still out. Mr. Dillon, you sure he ain't just a cowboy like you said? I was pretty sure, Chester, but this made me real sure. It was sticking out of his pocket. Oh, my. I'll get the rope. And we ought to hang him with it. <laughs> speed laws and other regulations as restrictive, or do you look upon them as protective? When a police officer writes a summons for traffic violations, do you see him as an enemy or friend? Your life may depend on your attitudes. Statistics clearly indicate that when laws are obeyed, deaths go down. It's no secret that emotional immaturity is the major factor in our accident rate. How else but childish can you describe the notion that breaking a traffic regulation is a way of getting away with something. What could be more infantile than believing one can prove his superiority by ignoring a stoplight? Unfortunately, too many drivers on the road subscribe to that kind of emotional outlook. The result is tragic. Almost 85% of all traffic accidents in America are caused by careless, childish driving. We hope sincerely that your attitudes are adult. We hope you know our traffic laws and the people who enforce them are there to help save your life. See anything yet, Chester? There's some dust about a mile away. Is it moving? Right this way. I reckon maybe half a dozen riders. Your friends don't take many chances, do they, Steph? They ain't no friends of mine. Yeah, well, I'll tell them that when they get here. You better turn me loose. You ain't gonna tell nobody nothing. You mean they won't like it? You're being all tied up that way, huh? I mean, you ain't got a chance, Marshal. I know you about right, Mr. Dillon. How are we gonna fight six men? I've been thinking, Chester. But we can't stand up to six men. We wouldn't have a chance. No, we wouldn't. I'm gonna do something I never did before in my life. What? Get your bandana and fix steps so he can't talk. Good. Well, I ain't gonna do you no good. You shut up and get on your feet. Here's a bandana. Here, I'll do it. On your feet, Stan. Come on, come on. All right, get our rifles, Chester. Yes, sir. Turn around. Oh, no. That ought to keep you quiet, Stan. All right, now walk. Here's your rifle. Oh, thanks. Now you get down behind that log over there, Chester. Yes, sir. I'm going to keep Stan with me right here. All right, step, lie down. If you make any noise, I'll split your skull, so help me. Now, go on, lie down. Okay, Chester. All right, keep the sun off your rifle. They're getting pretty close. Quiet now. What? What are we going to do? Fight it out from here? Chester, I'd hate for either of us to get killed by men like them. When I start shooting, you start. You take whoever's on your side first and then work in. Yeah, so they'll never know it. Shut up now. Here they are. It must be over to the river. We'll get down and wait here for them. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Stapp's killed them already. We didn't hear no shooting, did we? I don't like this, Jake. Stapp should have been back a long time ago. Stapp knows what he's doing. Well, well, them sure fine horses, ain't they? Now, Chester! Don't shoot no more! All right. Throw your guns away. Sure. Now turn around. Get your hands up in the air. All right, Chester, come over here. We killed four of them, Mr. Dillon. 
Four of them. Bring staff up to the fire. I'll handle these. Two. Yes, sir. Well, you two stopped just in time. You can turn around now. Who are you? What'd you ambush us for? Why, you done killed four men. I'm a U.S. Marshal, mister. You are lying. Am I? What kind of marshal would ambush a bunch of men like that? My kind, mister. I'm tied to Van Damme, Mr. Dillon. No, no you shouldn't talk now. It was murder. That's what it was. That was plain murder. It sure was. Even if he is a marshal, he'll hang for this. He never give us a chance. You're right, mister. I didn't give you a chance. There were too many of you. And besides, I never knew any men that deserved a chance less than you. What are you talking about? We ain't done nothing. No. I found this yellow hair ribbon in your friend Stapp's pocket. Here, yeah, take a look at it. Well, what's this? This ain't nothing, just a little yellow ribbon. There was more than just the ribbon. You blasted fool, Stan. No, no. I, no uh, I didn't take nothing else. That was just kind of a souvenir. I, I told you to get rid of everything. You know, Stap, I'm sorry you came in alone. I wish you had been with the others. But I'm going to see you hanged, all three of you. It's that little girl's yellow hair ribbon that's going to hang you. <laughs> Repeat after me, please. What do you want when you need brand? What do you want when you need brand? Reliability. Reliability. Now, what do you get in Kellogg's All Brand? What do you get in Kellogg's All Brand? Reliability. Right. Hi, this is Dennis James to explain why Kellogg's Way is the reliable way to get the effectiveness you want from brand with just half a cup a day. See, Kellogg's All Brand is the real Battle Creek formula the one that millions of people depend on. And they depend on it because Kellogg's All Brand contains more vital brand bulk to help you keep regular. It's low in calories, and it's mighty pleasant eating, too. Kellogg's All Brand comes in crisp, toasted shreds that have a wholesome brand muffin taste. I think you'll like it. So be sure you remember, for the effectiveness you want from brand, get reliable Kellogg's All Brand. That's what you get in Kellogg's All Brand. Reliability. Gunsmoke. Produced and directed in Hollywood by Norman McDonald. Stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Stodkin, John Daner, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. This is George Walsh inviting you to join us again next week when CBS Radio presents another story on Gunsmoke. For instant facts and fun, America listens most to the CBS radio network. Hello there, I'm Art Linkletter with eight-year-old Tommy, whose hobby is, uh, what is it, Tommy? Working butterflies. Oh, that sounds like fun. What do you want to be when you grow up? A doctor. Well, what kind of a doctor? A people doctor. Oh, <laughs> Tommy is one of the many children carrying on a personal fight against a crippling handicap. And children like Tommy receive regular training at their local Easter Seal centers all over the country. And it's amazing to see all the things they can do. These children can be helped to use the abilities they do have with proper care. Easter Seals provide this care from your contributions. This year, I'm pleased to be the national chairman of the Easter Seal Drive. If there's a crippled child in your community, give him the chance to show what he can do. You can help cripple children by giving to Easter Seals.